So as we all know all over the world, we've all been impacted by COVID in so, so many ways. I mean, look, you can look at it from economies, uh, globally, uh, regionally, nationally, even locally. And there are two things happening. Either you see it as an opportunity or a risk to wait and see and don't do anything about it. So I think that this afternoon conversation will focus briefly on, yes, we all know the background is a health uh, issue. Uh, we'll look at the brief background of COVID, which we are all very much conversant with, and then a brief on the impact on the various sectors. And then also, of course, there are also demand and supply issues we've got to deal with, and then zero in on the impact on the resource industry. Of course, whenever something happens, there has to be an immediate response. And I know most of us have been undertaking certain measures. So we'll look at some of the responses that people have taken. And then also, not just that, in as much as you are thinking of the short term, you're also looking at the medium to long term as well. And then also, whatever decisions you take or strategies you take, how do you assess these strategies? Because there are so many of them. But then let's we just discuss how we can even assess them to see whether they are relevant for us. And you know, COVID is still unfolding. We are not very sure uh, how it will end. So we'll end the presentation with some questions for all of us. Mm -hmm. So President, maybe you can go on to the next screen. Yeah. So th those are the table of contents. So the next one, Mr. President. So the next thing, please. Yeah. So this is, we all know about this. I mean, what I've just said is that, as we all know, initially, the work was done by London School of Economics. And they were saying that when one person is infected, it could, uh, it could, that person could also infect three people. But you've realized that over the past few months, it's far more than that. Even one person can affair, infect hundreds and hundreds of people. What we all say is that we are still not sure, we don't have the cure for it, we don't know how it will turn out in the long run, but one thing is certain, we can't just sit down and wait, we've got to act. And so that's why it's important that no matter where we find ourselves, we take proactive steps to ensure that at least we're in a very good position to be winners and then champions. Yes, if you look at the impact on various sectors, I mean, it's very clear that because of border closures, social distancing, uh, distancing measures, tourism and hospitalities, they've been hit seriously. I mean, you are not talking about uh, low occupancy rates. You are looking at virtually none, not at all. So then if you're in a situation like this, how then do you reorganize yourself? If you look at aviation, uh, especially, let's zoom down to aviation, planes have been grounded. And the question is that, no matter the analysis we have in place, how then are you well positioned to even manage? So the question is that how long can you continue? How much cash reserves do you have? And what kind of arrangement do you have with banks to ensure that you stay afloat? Because now you are, you are more like in a survival mode than a thriving mode. So how do you get out of the situation? Governments are not prepared to open their borders. I hear some are looking at I mean, this month and then the following month, but you can imagine the strain on the business over the last few months. If you look at oil, which is also quite interesting, you know, I mean, the resource sector, oil's case is a bit interesting because you realize that, look, you can't just get up and shut down your production because people are not taking up the commodity. You know, the process has to go as we are all very much aware, but the issue is that you are producing now, you have been having challenges where to store them. Now people are not taking up aviation fuel. And then interestingly, I mean, airlines are not flying. So then what happens? You keep producing and producing, how, how, how do you make money? So these are all the difficult situations they find themselves. Now automobile, you know, normally one of the key things of automobile is that you have to have a very strong supply chain management system. So we all know that in China, for example, there were issues with disruptions in terms of supply chain. And obviously if that is the case, it's certainly going to impact uh, on the, the service delivery of the whole chain. Consumer products, now consumers are assessing what they buy, uh, and then also they are not even going out in the first place, what they buy, what they eat. Of course, don't forget that their disposable income has been affected. So you're also looking at a switch whereby, how then do we also 
reposition ourselves in terms of our spending pattern. So we realize that with this pandemic, there's a supply side issue where there are problems with your inputs. Now, so this is a double edged sword. In as much as you are trying to deal with the supply side issue, yes, now you get it and you produce. Now, the other side is that the, the consumption side, the demand side, where also there are also challenges. People are getting to review their spending patterns, not just individuals, but in, even corporate as well. And yeah, if you look at the next slide, it just reinforces what we are saying. Yeah, there's the next slide, just reinforces what we are saying. You look at it, and then one thing comes to mind. Um, you know, if you, you look at the graph very well, you realize that. Look at the graph. COVID is impacting more than ever, apart from the global financial crisis, which affected metals and then, and then other industries as well, mining, metal, and other industries as well. You realize that COVID is more severe than Ebola, severe than SARS, MERS, because, you know, COVID is a pandemic. And normally when markets are very uncertain you realize that they panic a bit they make irrational decisions which normally reflect but you know with gold it the trend has changed a bit i mean but they're also being very cautiously optimistic because i mean you know normally when the dollar when interest rates on the dollar uh, are low and then investors are a bit uncertain they see gold as a safe haven and then you realize that they move funds into and then invest in gold, which creates that demand for gold. For how long will it continue? So obviously, you may have to be very careful. And then, in, in as much as gold is making some gains, at least let's be a bit also a bit cautious to be sure whether indeed it's not investors just trying to see it as, as a safe haven. So that at least in terms of our investment into assets, we may have to tread a bit cautiously. Yes, that's on that slide. And I'll look at the other one. Let's look a bit as some of the impacts on the resource industry, specific uh, issues when it comes to the resource industry on the next slide. Now, the first one, as we all know, every institution has been, have been affected or sector, which is the usual reduction in the workforce through implementation of the social distancing protocol. You know, when the lockdown started, even some mines had to be shut. So you had to change your operating model. You couldn't have everyone on site. I know mining, you have a lot of people working. So you are also a bit careful, how then do you manage the whole process? So it was an, one area that mines had to look at in terms of their operating model. The other was shutting up of operations. Some mines had to shut, especially during the lockdown. So imagine that you don't have some sort of scenario planning in place. If I, if I don't produce for one month, what happens? If I don't produce for two months, what happens? If it's three months, what happens? At what point do I need some sort of help, either from my banks or from my owners? The other one was the uncertainty of demand. I mean, as long as you have a pandemic, there's uncertainty around. Those who make purchases may have to review their purchasing policy. Those who, take, those who create demand, they also have to look at uh, their demand policy and then all that. The other one was the issue about supply chain. And I was very happy when I heard some of the mines where when it comes to supplies, they were quite okay. They have some space and then all that. But let me also add that it, it's also quite important that in terms of your supply chain, you have, there's, so, there's focus on the reliability of the supplier, which is very key, and then also availability of the space. And this is where the importance of data, big data analytics come in place. That at any point in time, it's such like that the machines are used because of how they are built with uh, sensors and all that, I can predict my space, as much as possible to help me as to when to request for some or not. Of course, the last one is dealing with uncertainty. Because I, like I said, you know, previously when we are doing analysis, our focus was on economic factors and then also economic factors and business factors, maybe interest rates, price of the oil, grade of the oil. I mean, which was quite, it wasn't easy, but at least you could manage. Now you have a pandemic. You don't know the shape and nature of it. So it, uh, it's telling us that, look, Going for it, it's very important how we can predict, how, how we can improve our scenario planning analysis so that we can frame our own future. Of course, we, we are not magicians, we cannot predict entirely, but at least it gives us an idea about how the future will turn out to be. 
because you know uh, in the, in the mining industry or resource industry is asset heavy. And once you sink in money, no, some of the investments are even irreversible. So it means that going forward, the question is that how then do we manage uncertainty properly? How then do we improve on our, uh, what's it called, scenario planning, stress testing, to be, to be sure that if we should find ourselves in that situation, now we don't know what can come up. Now it's health. What would come up at that time, we are not quite sure. But at least, to a very large extent, if we keep reviewing our scenario planning analysis, at least we'll be in a better position to even, even address issues as and when they come up. The next slide, please. Kindly forgive me. I'm sure President will share the slides and it's, it's still very been difficult to log in. Now, this was the immediate response. Normally, you look at this first from the humanitarian point of view, health and safety, which I know was very critical. All minds were doing it. At least the safety of the staff was very critical from the beginning. So you created the awareness, telling people to wear masks, improve their hygiene habits. It was very good. Because good for the firm, because if someone gets infected, it's going to affect your productivity. So in as much as you are very thoughtful of employees, the company is also putting itself in a very good position to, position to ensure that they are not found wanting. So you look at the humanitarian side, which is very important. The other one is the economic side. In terms of business continuity, which I think that, of course, you have to come with different models. You can't have one on site. So then what then do you do? You may have to look at ways in, in which in order to maintain productivity, finding off, I mean, with mines, you have to be on site. Unless, of course, you have a different operating model whereby you do, you do, you, do, you, you, work, you work remotely. But if that's not the case, then it means that there might be a bit of a difficulty. You can't have one on site and it has implication for productivity. The other one was the fact that I mean, with the social distancing protocols, of course, you can't have people close to each other. So at the end of the day, it means that, look, uh, it may impact on productivity in a way. So it's up to management to come with a very good operating model to ensure that it doesn't impact it so much. So that was it for economic side. Of course, financial side. It's important that with this crisis, you need to do some sort of financial analysis to ascertain whether you are in a survival mode or a thriving mode. Now, if you're in a survival mode, it means that what is happening is that you are virtually sub surviving. So the key thing is cash. Do we have enough reserves? It's so, so important to pay suppliers, to pay our partners. It's very important. If not, can we have a financing arrangement to ensure that at least at any point in time, we may not be found wanting? So it's very key that you look at liquidity. Cash, they say, is king. So it's very important that you look at the financing arrangement. Of course, you may have to put a hold on CAPEX, capital investment, because now you need to deal with things as and when they are coming. And then also, of course, you may have to renegotiate terms with your partners, delay payments here and there to ensure that at least you can function properly. The other one is operational, but whereby you look at, you look at the whole value chain, the mining value chain, see where inefficiency are, try and, you try and look at if you can automate part of the process. Of course, we are not saying that you can go full automation. You look at the problem where you can make efficiency gains through automation so that at least uh, to some extent, in as much as you are losing people on site, machines may do part of the job that was supposed to be done by people. The next, that, so that's the immediate response. The next slide will look at more of an immediate to long-term response. And this, if you look at this diagram, sorry, it's not a bit clear. The four major areas you need to consider when creating value is, uh, as I have it, a strategy and its uh, execution. And then the second one is innovation. These two are value adding activities. They are the activities that generate value. These are the activities that generate cash. And then you look at the other two, which is compliance and risk management. And these are activities that protect value. So as long as you keep a healthy balance between activities that generate value and activities that protect value, you realize that on the whole, your value becomes sustainable and shareholders are happy. We'll briefly go into them one after the other, but that will be pretty quick. So maybe on the next slide, I'll talk briefly about each of them and how important and relevant and practical they, they are to us. So on the next slide, so on the next slide, I'm talking briefly about 
innovation. Basically, innovation is doing new things or all things differently. So it could be a new process, it could be a new product, a new, new business model. So all we are saying is that you can continue to do things the same way. So we are constantly reviewing how you do things and improving upon them. And of course, that innovation can largely be driven by IT, largely by IT. So we realize that, for example, now uh, we know that uh, workers, even what they wear, the protective equipment, you can even pick conditions, you can pick their working, even as they wear it, you can pick certain conditions so that, look, if there's an issue, maybe help with someone, at least as soon as possible, you can really pick that one up. I mean, it's, it's all our minds, some minds are using it. And then uh, operating minds from remote uh, areas, you know, there are certain minds that it's very difficult to assess. Of course, if there are opportunities to operate them from remote areas, if you have quite a long, large chunk being automated, then of course, with this social, with this social distancing protocols, it might, it might not impact you so much. Of course, we don't expect that every mind becomes automated. It's not possible. But if there's a possibility, why not? You realize that you could use less to achieve more. The other one is improving connectivity among the machines. You know, what is happening is that there's, there's what we call internet of things, whereby uh, you have along the value chain, all the assets you use, whether the drills, the trash, uh, that, that holds the material, there are sensors in there that you can pick your data. So number of trips to the dump site, the stockpile, oh, you're just picking data. You're not using a pen or in a computer. You are just in the office and then data is being picked. And along the chain, there's that integration of data being picked. So they don't need to pick data twice. You pick it from here, pick it from there, compare. No, it's so integrated that data along the chain is picked either right down from exploration, you mine, you haul, mill, it's all the well integrated. So at any point in time, it helps in decision making. Of course, like I said, data analytics is a big thing we have to, whereby, for example, in terms of our cars, uh, or the trucks, you know that typically you might say that, oh, we might maintain them every three months. But these are not um, uh, personal vehicles. These are commercial, you're using them to produce. So it means that, for example, you cannot say that, well, I'll just maintain them every two months or one month. We, we can't do preventive maintenance when it comes to these expensive assets we use. We may have to think of predictive maintenance to the extent that the sensors in it will tell us the wear and tear, how certain space may need to be replaced. So at any point in time, we, we, bet, we realize that because we do predictive maintenance, the machines are well maintained and they will be in a position to produce. So it's, it's very important that we do that. Of course, we've talked about here already, where those who do, uh, they, they are driverless trucks now. I mean, in terms of drilling, no human intervention. So these are things, of course, it, it, it can cut across, but something that could be considered. So that's by the one on. Uh, innovation. On the next slide, yeah, so these are some of the firms that are using automation to, to make gains, as you can see over there. So Rio Tinto, uh, mine, uh, by Rio Tinto, BHP, and then all that. So we can just go on to the next one. So I'll talk about some benefits of technology. You know, with, with mining, mining is asset, or, or, or the resource sector is very asset heavy. You have huge machines. And then we are saying that, and through engineering, these machines have been brought together to produce a material buried within the earth or under the sea. Now, what is happening is that, now I said that we need IT to see how best we can get the best out of the infrastructure, the machines. So IT cannot be taken out of the conversation. And there are some benefits of IT. Like I said, it improves predictability. As you are aware, the resource at times, you are not even clear about the nature of the resource in terms of its characteristics, its grade, but with, with improvement of IT, 
we intend to be able to more or less predict better the conditions of the particular resource. Health and safety, like I said, now with the improvement of technology, I mean, whether slope conditions, rock conditions, at least there are technology for us to pick incidents that could happen way ahead so that at least we can save their staff. Of course, as long as IT is in the machines, come in the reduced cost as well. And then smarter procurement, you know, procurement is a big thing. Smarter procurement, because as long as we have a better prediction of the performance of these assets on site, it means that we don't just procure spares, even as and when we don't need them, but at least we are, we are informed way ahead of time uh, how much or how much or how much it will cost us in terms of these space. And of course, as it will help us improve in the utilization so that assets don't lie idle uh, at the other side. And then also it will improve productivity, the workforce, because now there's some sort of an enabler, which is IT in terms of their delivery. On the next one, just, just before this one, I think there's a slide just before this one. Mr. President, yes, on the next one. So the, the, the other one is review of your strategy. You know, strategy is not static. Strategy basically is your plan of action to hit your targets. And then we are saying that others will say, that, of course, our plan is that we have a certain weakness. So what we'll do is I'll rather acquire another company and build on that weakness. Or we have reserves. We feel that no, we can do that through partnerships with maybe either IT companies or other partners which could help us. So depending on the strategy you want, is it depends on your own situation and then condition. We are saying that now it's no longer how big you are, but how connected you are. And I'll explain. What we are saying is that, for example, if you are very connected to your supplies, they don't just produce you spares or inputs. The relationship is not just transactional. The relationship is strategic. They understand your growth plans. They understand your strategy. They understand where you are going. You realize that at any point, and because of that strong partnership, it improves the way you do business and even help you build value. So we believe that look at the whole mining ecosystem, build strong partnership with various partners that, come, that you engage. And then as long as you strengthen that partnership, what will happen is that you tend to be stronger, even in situations like this. And then also look at how your, your operating model. I mean, now maybe probably with all the protocols, things may not be working well. And then, I mean, look around and, 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 and see what others are doing and see if you can benefit. The other one is your financial strategy. In terms of your funding, how are you funding your long-term projects? Is it from reserves? Or you may have to disinvest some, sell some assets and release cash to pump in existing ones. Do you need to reduce exposure in certain areas, in certain regions? It's a, a time has come that you have to do a review. Because with all that's happening, with all the restrictions all around, you may have to think of a review so that at least you're not found wanting if it gets worse. So that's on the review of, on, of strategy. But let me add on the next slide is any time you want to deploy any strategy, whether to buy another mine, whether to invest in equipment, whether to invest in IT, there's a test that you have to always do to ensure that you don't throw money down the drain. And then they call it the SFA test. The first one is suitability. How does it fit? What, whatever investment you're doing, how does it fit with your current position? And I'll explain. How will you seize opportunities by undertaking that particular investment? How will you address your weaknesses as a firm by undertaking? Let me give you a typical example. I mean, maybe you look at your mind and look, you cannot just overnight just say that you are doing uh, what you are going remote. So everything is being automated on site. So you just sink and pump him and it doesn't work that way. So all we are saying is that look at the opportunities look at the realities on the ground and decide whether this decision we are taking, how does it fall in line with the opportunities out there? How will it make us more stronger? How will it let us address 
whatever weakness we have. So that's on the suitability side. The other one is the acceptability side. Those who have invested in the mine or the oil company, the question is that how are the returns like or the potential returns? Having looked at the numbers, does it justify this investment? Are we going to recoup and still make money to pay owners back or debt lenders? Then also, let's look at the risk appetite of the firm. Does it fall in line with the risk appetite of the firm? Do we have the capacity to absorb that risk? So for example, if you pump in money, do you have the capacity to lose a certain percentage of the investment? We've got to be honest with ourselves that do we mind if we lose like 30% of the investment and still survive? If you know that you're a bit shaky when it comes to raising money, then you will have to tread cautiously. So you have to look at both the return you're making on it and then the risk. If you don't look at the risk, then you're probably just doing gambling. But it's important that your return is consistent with the risk you're taking. And then the last one is that feasibility. Will it work in practice? You have, you, you have your staff strength, you invest in huge, huge systems. Now we can't even use it because we don't have the, the human resources in place, the infrastructure in place, the architecture in place to be able to deploy that strategy. In fact, others talk of another, which is sustainability. Is a strategy sustainable? Can you carry it on to the end? So I think that whatever decision you want to take, strategy you want to take, at least let it go through this test. And I strongly believe that at least it will go a very long way to help. Mr. President, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah. I think the PC is frozen, so that's why I'm, str I'm struggling a bit. Yeah. So you remember we talked about the two main areas. That is the, the strategy and innovation, which creates value. But then the other two, which is risk management and compliance, what they do is that they protect value. The first one is compliance. So first of all, it's important that the firm looks at both internal and external regulatory compliance. I mean, for a man, internal, you know, you know you, there are targets, I mean, on site, environmental issues. Uh, I think that though it's being done, there should be a deliberate effort to really do that classification to ensure that you're not found wanting it. If that should happen. So there are certain internal limits you've got to abide by. Now, it's difficult to make more money, so let's protect. So let's go to a process and know that, look, with all our internal guidelines, they are duly being followed. That's one. The external regulatory side is also important, whether they are tax issues, environmental issues, which is also a very big thing, ensuring that we are on point, just to be, just to be sure that we don't, fly, we don't put ourselves in a situation whereby we may have to be paying penalties when we may have to save money. So operational side, the health and safety issues, among others. I mean, general conduct of business to put us in a situation that at least at any point in time, if we are not able to make more money, at least we are protecting ourselves from making, uh, we, are, we are protecting ourselves from losing money. So either we are making money or at least whatever we make, we protect it and then we, we, we don't lose money. The, the next slide talks about the other leg when it comes to value protection, which is dealing with risk and uncertainty. So the next one, dealing with risk and uncertainty. If, if Mr. President would just go on to the next slide for me, I'll be more than happy. So you know, more often than not, the folk, when it comes to risk, well, it's not easy to deal with it, but at least you have an idea. So for example, a environmental risk, a regulatory risk, I mean, Risks with relation to the characteristics of the all body, characteristics of the all body. I mean, you could mention on and on, but there's one side we've not we've got to deal with when it comes to uncertainty, which is very difficult to, which is very difficult to, to deal with. But uncertainty because you have no idea it can come up. You have no idea. Risk you can deal with it because at least you have an idea. There's a past uh, observation. When it comes to uncertainty. It's happening for the first time. So what then do you do? That's where scenario planning comes in. It's very, very important that we do scenario planning. Very, very key. Very, very key. It's important that we do scenario planning. It's very, very key. It's very, very key. Because what it does is that you, you tend to frame your own future. So you look at what could possibly go wrong. I mean, previously, 
it was basically, like I said, economy factors, business factors. Now there are health factors. What could happen tomorrow, we have no idea. But I believe that if there is a review of various scenarios, crafting various scenarios, what if the good price goes up by this or that? What if there's this environmental issue? What if there's a health issue? What if this happens? What will happen to our numbers? At least once we put in our best and try and do a review, won't be taking a back if something should go wrong. So I must say that whatever our business continuity plans are, giving it uncertainty, it's very critical that we keep that at the back of our minds. On the next one, Mr. Chairman, I think that, I think that Mr. Chairman, what, what I will add in conclusion, the fact that, like I said, the effect of the pandemic is as we all know. So obviously we cannot all conclude and say that we are all out of the rules here. But I think I have some questions that probably we can all go and think about and then probably in our discussions, who knows, it, it, it might help in a way. And I look at it from um, in maybe three main lenses from an operational point of view, financial point of view, and strategic point of view. Now, from the Operational point of view, it's important that like, what is the impact on your operation? It's very key that we have that discussion, that what is the impact of your operation, productivity, how is COVID impacting on it? Of course, management will be expected to send reports to the board for them to have an appreciation of that. And then if that is the case, how are they mitigating possible risk that comes with it? And if there are serious issues, how are we managing the business recovery path. So from the operational side, it's something that needs to be considered. From the strategic part, we may have to look at what is the clear path we may have to look at in achieving our long-term growth. There has been a bump. COVID has given us a bump. So we are seeing that what is a clear path we may have to take in order to ensure that we come back onto a non portholes path in achieving our targets? Will it be driven by acquisition of new assets through m and Will it be through partnerships with other firms, strategic I mean, or will it also be investing in IT? Ah, so these are things that from the strategic lens we may have to look at. And from the financial lens, we may have to look at how do we get through the next few months? So let's look at the numbers, our cash position, liquidity position. Of course, we may need to have some conversations. Do we need to sell some of the assets to release cash? It's, it's also very important. We need to renegotiate our loan terms. I mean, these, no, it's all about, I think that if we may have to, it's important that we may have to even renegotiate our loan terms because the environment is such that everyone is ready to listen. We may have to look at that. And then also, I'll just end by saying that um, we all know that the impact of COVID-19 cannot be quantified. It is very clear. But we believe that going forward, every business, including those in the resource sector, should take a second look at their, what we normally call business continuity plan. Having that system in place to address issues should they happen. And not just have one and keep it, do a review, have a system in place in place to ensure that any time there is, this time it's a pandemic, we don't know what can come up, any time there's an issue that impacts on operations, we can come out successfully. And then also, lastly, it's very certain that the business environment is uncertain. So I'm saying that, I'll end by also saying that if we can kindly also take scenario planning to the very next level, try and frame my own future so that when things hit our path, we'll be in a better position to deal with them. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for this uh, fantastic uh, event. And then uh, to uh, my senior, Kwesia Du Boahen, for that great presentation. I mean, you are, you are a fellow um, at SEMA, and I'm an associate, so you are my senior. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I have a couple of questions here. Um, with respect to um, the management of 
COVID-19 cases in some of these um, um, extractive industries, specifically the oil and gas, as you have touched on, um, we, we, we have noticed that, you know, um, on the FPSO, some cases have been reported, just as some mining companies have also reported some cases. In this instance, how do you manage your high potential or high level staff um, against this, you know, uh, infection? And, and what would be the possible strategy for, for companies to deal with such instances if um, they have some of these high potential staff being infected? That would be the first one. The, okay. the second one, um, you, you've touched on scenario planning and you've articulated it, you know, very well. Um, it, in, in mining, you know, we deal with most um, uh, critical specs. Yeah. These times that uh, um, logistics, you know, it's a bit problematic because um, airlines are not moving. What would be the, uh, the, 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 the possible ways to manage if a mining company has to fly a critical part uh, to, to augment its stock or for an agent replacement. The, the third uh, question, that's the last but one, who, who you have touched on so much on the business continuity planning. I think we all know now that most companies have business continuity plan for regulatory purposes because COVID-19 has actually shown that um, we, we just put business continuity plan on paper, but in effect, it, it does not work. So you touch a bit on the way forward on that, but I just want you to situate it with the mining companies uh, to see how we can deal with that. And then my last question on the Internet of Things. Um, okay. You know, Internet of Things would require that we dealing with 4G and probably moving to 5G so you can have um, speed of connectivity and all. Um, currently, we can look at some of the IT infrastructure within our, our mining companies, oil and gas institutions, organizations. And then also the available infrastructure that our telcos have to support implementation of IOTs. How do we manage or handle this um, in, 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 in this COVID situations? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I went on the first one. Let me just find out. We're talking about how to protect critical staff. Um, you may not protect, you may not be able to protect them at yeah. this stage, but yeah. if, if a high potential staff should have you know, let's say your, your last man who is in charge of your, of your gold room uh, has COVID and all that. <laughs> I think that, okay, maybe, let, let, let me start with the, the, maybe the internet. I just start and go up. Um, like rightly said, more often than not, most of the minds, it, it's not easy just switching and saying that, look, from now on, all we are going to do is that, look, everything is being automated. It's not, it's, not, it's not practical, it's not possible. And is the infrastructure in place, it's also under question. But let me just say that I know that even now with some of the tracks, some do have experiences. Not we, we are not thinking of the, the system whereby almost every asset on site, there's a coordination. So for example, I know now, even when I'm going to pick, when I'm doing exploration now, be, once you have these, uh, these drones and that they can put coordinates here and there, and then that is fed into a central point, and then we have an idea about uh, the old body and all its characteristics. Secondly, even with the tracks that move back and forth, going to the dam site and all that, uh, instead of human intervention and recording, a, B, C, D, at least you have sensors which can give feeds to the central office and tell you where, whether it's going to the dark side or it's going to what, so, so what we are saying is that we may not be like the, 
the very sophisticated, we shouldn't think of the very hugely sophisticated ones, but let's start gradually with, uh, like I said, just uh, enhancing the machines we have now with uh, some senses to help us reduce the human intervention and then uh, uh, the excess data we have all around us, which at times is very difficult to harmonize them. So I believe that we shouldn't go boom, 5G and then get all the state of the technology. But let's try and start gradually with the basics, census here and there to help uh, at least us in terms of how we pick our feed from, or feeds from the various, uh, what's it called, uh, work or the value chain when it comes to the resource industry. So let's start a bit small. Uh -huh. see that. Let's start a bit small and not wait till everything is in place and get the state of the art. Uh, what our advisor, what normally people call the RPAs, robotic process automation, you look at the whole process and look at which part of the process that we feel that for now we can bring in an intervention of a sort to help us. So let's look at the whole process, especially the repetitive ones, uh -huh. whether it's haulage, uh, whatever it is, you look at the repetitive ones and say, oh, well, this is the repetitive part how can we, to a very large extent, uh, automate part of the process? So let's look at the process bit by bit and not uh, try and then overnight uh, do a state of the art. Yes, I think that helps. So that's the other one. The other one, the business continuity plan, like you said, you are right. I mean, regulatory purposes. Normally, almost every industry, you know that. Uh, do you have one? Then we take, yeah. No, do you not? Yes. But like I said, you see, what happens is that it's something that our advice that even on a yearly basis, we do a review. So, and it's not just transaction it's strategy because you are saying that if this happens, what then did you realize that even in the plan, it would be nice whereby we have these scenarios embedded in it in a way. If this happens, what happens? If we stop operating for one month, what happens? Two months, what happens? Three months, what happens? By the time it's six months, the conversation might change. So I believe that it should, it, it, should, it should reflect time, some sort of annual review of the plan. So in there you have those responsible, the champions, the directors involved, the management involved, their responsibility, if there's an emergency, if there's a pandemic, what do we do? How do we communicate? If the pandemic is health, what happens? If it's false magic, I mean, the whole idea is that, like I said, you can't get it perfect. We are all no magicians, but at least, to the extent that is, is reflective of what is happening currently to us. So I believe that on a yearly basis, like I said, not just a plan to make the regulators happy, but people who are responsible for certain actions, like I said, if something should bring our business to a halt, what happens to us? If it's one month, what happens? If it's two months, what happens? If it's three months, what happens? And interestingly, as we go about our normal business, we'll pick things up. Each hey, if this happens, if if the if this mailing machine breaks down, what happens? If this process breaks down, what happens? If, if there's a halt in this process, what happens to us? You look at the whole chain and ensure that the BCP, which is the business quality plan, covers everything. So we are moving beyond just satisfying the regulator. But then to the extent that these things are prevented, let's give a, let me give you a typical example. Remember the Tema 1, that one person infected 500 people. Can you imagine that happens in the mind? You go one day and then 500 people are infected. I mean, you see the impact. You might think that it's so small, a virus just affected one person, and then 500 are infected. So that changes the whole conversation. It, it turns your whole production schedule up, upside down. So I believe that now, in our senior planning, like I said, let us not just focus on the money side, business and economic factors, but now like we are saying, now we know there's one, there's one monster, health, it could happen. I mean, health issue can impact our business, our mental issue can impact our business. What are they? Once we brainstorm, you'll be amazed that people come with ideas and tell you exactly where we have issues here and there. The other is a critical space. I'll say that, you see, your suppliers, the relationship with your suppliers should change. It should no longer be transactional. Uh, like, oh, we want, we get, we need, they give us, blah, blah, blah. It should be more 
the, the, the supply chain strategy should be more, like I said, it should be strategic. So for example, like you said, I have supplier A. Uh -huh. To the extent that, look, it's just in time. When they need that, you bring, it's not that I'll be, of course, I may need a place to store them and all that. If it's, norm, it's been normally strategic, then look, the supply is part of your growth plans. It's part of uh, where you are going. So they are part of course, and I'll use one. I mean, technically, it, will be, it won't be easy. If I use one, then I know if they should happen, then what happens to me? The supplies, the supplies are such that the relationship, like I said, is strategic. It's not transactional. So they are part of my growth plans. And now, even when I'm building a BCP, I should have in it within the mining ecosystem how I can deal with my supplies as well. That's one. And then the high staff one, you know, that, that's a tricky one. In fact, that one, hmm. So like we said, uh, now it has come to stay that uh, we need both uh, humans and then uh, machines as well. Uh, so we may have to assess critical jobs on the website. You know, some jobs are so critical that we can't afford that. All the knowledge and expertise lies in just one person or two. I think we need to look at which functions are very critical and then have resources in place and a backup should something go wrong. Uh -huh. So I think that those are those are my few comments. I'm sure others can add if they may want. Yeah, but thank you very much. Um, there's just one or two questions we can take and go on. There's this one from um, James German. He's asking okay. if you think um, post COVID 19, will employers still keep the same number of employees and roles? <laughs> I mean, considering that most, of, most employees have been off their staff for months or are currently working remotely. <laughs> oh, I, I think that. The, the question is that post COVID 19, will employees have the right skill set to still protect their jobs? I think that now digital skills are more important than ever. So, my issue is that employers will start looking at roles specific. They, they won't target employees by looking at roles specific. And, like, oh, yeah, I, I thought that we had 10,000, but I thought that we could even do with, with five or 6,000. So, I think that the conversation will be like that employers review the way things are done. So employees should this time position themselves and then look at enhancing their skills in the area of digital skills, learning how to use tools to chain insights from data so that they become very relevant if that should happen. So the conversation will go on, like I said, but like I said, employees should better position themselves very well so that at least if that should happen, they will still be valuable to the, employee, the employees. Yeah, and then Emmanuel Sunkari will want to know your view on this. If you yeah. thought uh, or ever thought of it that way, that before COVID-19, was the mining sector prepared for such an unforeseen pandemic? I, I think that, like, to be honest, hmm. not the resource, I mean, the, not just the resource, no one was really prepared for it. No one at all. But interestingly, like we said, like a coin, you have both a head and a tail. Obviously, I think now it's more of a wake up call. So, yeah. the issue now, like I said, is not just dealing with race, whatever you take. So, we've met this level. Oh, environmental, this, okay. Sinai level is okay. This is okay. No. Now, oh, what this pandemic is telling is that things can happen way beyond our control. So, which we normally call uncertainty. Uncertainty is things that happen that we are never sure. COVID is teaching us is that something can happen again. It might not be health. I don't know. But like I said, the opportunity is like that. It will better position us to deal with issues that come up in the future. Yeah, yeah I very much agree with you. And then um, uh, this is from Bright Entry. He says, as an incoming graduate, I don't know what that means. Can you suggest some know. of the things we can do in this current pandemic situation by way of skill acquisition? Oh, okay, okay. I think I'll say that the current graduates, they are blessed than ever. I, I, I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, we all know that even access to internet was, it was very expensive, very difficult. Now, it, they are huge. What I'll suggest is that learn, 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 develop. I'll, and I'll say some skills that are needed now, digital skills. How do you use tools to churn insights from data? It's very key. The other one is, communicating uh, communication skills 
not just speaking English, uh, Mr. President, but then how do you learn how to convey or unpack message to an audience? It's very, very important, whether they are owners of the business, whether they are your bosses, whether they are subordinates, whether they are, they are your clients. What is important is that these are skills that you've got to develop, emotional intelligence, creativity. These are things that machines cannot do. So the data skills to understand how to use machines better, get other skills that are soft that machines cannot do, then it will better prepare you for the future. So I think that's my advice to you, read. So learn new things. And then also, you should unlearn old things that are no longer working. It's also important that he does that as well. He or she does that. And then this from Emmanuel, probably the last question. This, in your estimation, how long do you think the mining sector will cope with the economic impact of the COVID-19, even when it's gone? Interestingly, like I already said, countries and companies and sectors are all uh, managing, seeing how long it will take for the economy to exit. Why? Because, you see, decisions are taken at a global level, regional level, national level. So I think that at least now we, ha we have, we, we, we may not be able to pinpoint and say that, well, in the next two months, it's ending or three months. We have this uncertainty we have to deal with. I think that now more, more than ever, it's time for us to frame our own future. Let's look at how things are. We have current operations. How are they impacting on, on uh, the various factors impacting our business? And now, like I said, not just on economic and financial factors, maybe interest rate. No, now there are things that we need to consider. Environmental, health, critical issues. So in the conversation, that's in addition to the normal economic and financial factors, incorporate environmental health, and possible other issues we may, I mean, people can even come up with. So the idea is not to look at when it will stop, but then how do I manage the process now? Yeah, I agree. And from your perspective, do you think companies are holding back their investment in a wait and see game? That's a question from Emmanuel. Also. Oh, okay. I, I, I know, you know, on the, on the, why am, uh, on, on the website, was it, uh, Prince who shared, someone shared, and others are investing. Uh, yeah, others are investing, that's true. Yeah, others are investing. So it depends on the risk appetite of the, the firm. I mean, for some firms, yeah, they are preserved. Yes, they think that, well, the price is going, nice appreciated. Why not? Let's go in there. But I think that as every firm is, is, is unique to every firm, what is your risk appetite? You should decide yeah. what risk appetite as a firm. You should decide on your risk. I know some are holding back, and it's 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 normal. It makes sense if you hold back, but you should decide what your risk appetite are. And others may want us to go into companies who are distressed and then buy them cheap, or assets that are distressed, buy them cheap. So you need to decide what your risk appetite is. I know it's normal that when there are certainties, people hold back. That is the norm. But you, should, in addition, decide on your risk appetite, and then that should go with the kind of reserves you have reserves you to go out and purchase. I wouldn't advise that go and be borrowing here yeah, because we see the price going up. So go and be borrowing and be buying. Don't just, we won't fold our hands and wait, but at least we are always reviewing the current situation consistent with our risk appetite. Well, if our, we have the appetite and we know that, look, if we purchase low now, this particular asset or project has a future, has, has a future to generate more cash for us. Why not? Like I said, let's test it to our process suitability, acceptability, feasibility. If it's workable, we can go in there. But I guess it makes sense to hold on, especially when you're going to borrow. Because then, because there's uncertainty, you go, you, you borrow money and then you can't pay back. Then the conversation changes. So yes, people are holding back because of the uncertainty. But they should just sit on the fence and wait. They should do a review, look at their risk after what they can take, what they cannot take, and then take an appropriate decision. Yeah, many times that we see for this lecture, revealing and then exposing us to the opportunities therein among the COVID-19 madness. We at the, the YM will continue to make sure professors remain relevant, mm. even after it's gone. That is in case it's <laughs> gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to the other particip um, the participants, um, look up to more of these lectures every other week um, going forward. 
we are um, trying to make sure everybody gets the requisite professional development. Uh, it can uh, add it to the career, your career development as well. A question should be available anytime you want to send your questions. We'll get it to him. We'll get it back to you. Thanks so much, everybody. And thanks, I see again, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your time.